Well, good a afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, presentation by the Fair Work Commission on making and defending an unfair dismissal application. My name is Deputy President Richard Clancy, and I'm here with Commissioner Michelle Bissett. And we're going to walk through a presentation um, which is aimed to provide some insights into uh, the sort of factors that need to be addressed in uh, making an unfair dismissal application and defending it uh, with regard to the Commission's processes and uh, the legislation that uh, 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 provides for the unfair dismissal rights and obligations. So uh, we'll commence now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the unfair dismissal applications account for over 40% of all of the applications that are made uh, to the Fair Work Commission. Um, obviously that's um, a substantial part of the workload of the Commission and it's um, of benefit we think in terms of assisting in the running of those matters that we um, explain and share as much as we can over time. Um, of how uh, the matters are best dealt with. Um, the first question, of course, in dealing with unfair dismissals is what is an unfair dismissal? Um, and um, clearly an employee um, is unfairly dismissed if the dismissal is harsh, unjust and unreasonable. And that's a definition that's contained in the Act. So it's important in addressing unfair dismissals that the fundamental of what an unfair dismissal is, uh, is dealt with. Who's protected from unfair dismissals? Well, not everyone. Um, you need to be, first of all, a national system employer, employee, my apologies. Um, you need to have been dismissed. Uh, uh, you need to have completed a minimum employment period and you need to earn uh, less than the high income threshold or be covered by an award uh, or agreement. The national system uh, is not a single national system which makes things a little bit more difficult um, for people in various states. Not everyone is a national system employee because different states have referred different parts of their powers to the federal, to the Commonwealth, to the federal system. In the Northern Territory, the ACT in Victoria, it's easy because everyone is a national system employee. In uh, Queensland, South Australia and New South Wales, um, all private enterprises are part of the national system, um, but state government and local government employees are not national system employees, so therefore are excluded from the unfair dismissal jurisdiction. In Tasmania, um, private enterprise and local government are in the system, but state government is excluded. And in Western Australia, only constitutional corporations um, are in the system. Uh, state government, non-constitutional corporations, local government are excluded. Uh, sorry, local government is not excluded. Um, uh, state government and uh, non-constitutional corporations, primarily small businesses, um, are not in the system in, um, uh, in WA. Um, there are certain people who aren't employees, of course, so contractors, um, or if there's not a contract of employment, the person may not be an employee. Um, uh, labour hire workers can't make a claim for unfair dismissal against the host employer, um, though they may have a claim against the labour hire company that actually engages them. People who are on vocational placements aren't employees, and uh, volunteers aren't considered employees, and therefore, if they are moved on from the work they're doing, um, aren't considered to have been dismissed or a national system employee for the purposes of um, the Fair Work Act. So the first uh, step that is involved with an unfair dismissal application is to uh, lodge the application. And it's not the mere um, lodging or filing of a complaint. Um, it's, uh, it starts with a, a document which um, 
then kicks off a process. How is an application uh, made? It can be um, lodged um, with the form over the counter, it can be done by mail, it can be done electronically. The Commission can also, under its rules, take an application over the phone. Um, and we still um, even um, receive applications by facsimile. Um, once the application is lodged, there's a, a series of uh, procedures to follow. Um, uh, there is the Form 2 unfair dismissal application. Um, uh, it's the, the quickest way to get your application underway um, by filling in that form. Uh, the form itself is designed in a way that will um, cover the various matters that uh, the Commission needs to be satisfied in terms of the person's eligibility to bring a claim and uh, it's designed to be in a form that then when the employer um, is served with that application uh, the employer can respond to it. The application must be made uh, within 21 days after the date of the dismissal. So the date of the dismissal is not day one. Day one is the first day after the dismissal and then you've got within 21 days to file the application. Um, it has to be accompanied by either the application fee, which is currently $71.90, or you can apply for a uh, waiver in turn, um, on the basis of economic hardship. Um, if you do not file it within 21 days after uh, the dismissal takes effect, um, then you have to uh, seek an extension of time. And uh, on, uh, in terms of that, as I said, the 21 days doesn't include the date the dismissal um, took effect. And if it falls on a Saturday or a Sunday or a public holiday, that is the 21st day, the time's extended to the next um, business day. Now, the Commission is above all a dispute settling body. Even when a, an application is filed late, uh, we will offer the parties an opportunity to um, try and resolve the dispute through conciliation. Um, and that will be listed and take place unless the employer objects and says, no, um, I want the extension of time application to be resolved first. In terms of the extension of time, what the Commission has to be satisfied of is that there were exceptional circumstances for why the application was not lodged within the 21 day time limit. And uh, included on the slides is the, uh, the full bench case which established um, what exceptional circumstances are, Nolte, Blue Star, Group, Proprietary Limited. It's very important if uh, a party is making an application for an extension of time that they address the criteria in section 394 subsection 3 uh, and that's the surest way of um, putting all the relevant material before the Commission is to address the specific criteria in that um, section of the Act and um, in, in terms of if you're the respondent to the application uh, again address um, your uh, your objection to the extension of time by addressing that criteria. At this point in the process, it's not, a, um, it's not the function of the Commission to decide the merits or otherwise of the application. Uh, the second step of the process, once an application is lodged, is that um, a Fair Work Commission case manager will check the application for certain details to make sure that uh, it is valid. At this point in time, they might engage with the parties and, and just check some of the details or seek some additional details, uh, but the case manager can't give advice on the claim. Um, they'll seek some information um, from the parties, for example, just to confirm the date that the person commenced employment and the date the employment ceased to make sure that um, the required period of employment was served. Um, other things such as the, the income level um, of, the, uh, of the claimant or the applicant um, but they can't give the parties information about the merits of their application. Uh, sorry, advice about the merits of their application. They can just give information on what a party needs to do to either uh, progress their application in the Commission or um, in the case of a respondent um, to respond to and defend that application. Uh, so once the application goes through that triage process, the employer is notified that an application has been made, uh, though we sent a copy of the application that has been made by the former employee. This might be the first time the employer has um, 
any notice that the person was going to make an application for unfair dismissal. Uh, and um, at that stage, um, they, uh, they might be um, shocked or frustrated, um, uh, or they'll uh, have anticipated it and be ready to um, engage with the process. It's very important for employers not to ignore the fact that an application has been made. Um, it simply won't go away. Um, and if an employer chooses not to engage in the process at all, uh, it will still, still be subject to a decision of the Commission one way or another. And uh, that, uh, that is not an uncommon occurrence. In fact, I had a case recently uh, where the employer did not engage uh, at all and uh, the application was upheld and compensation was order, awarded to uh, the employee. So uh, ignoring it will not make it go away. In terms of responding to an application, um, again the Commission has a standard form, this is the Form F3. Uh, it will um, provide the various signposts to the employers to the matters that they need to address uh, in terms of responding to the application. The rules of the Commission require that that Form F3 be um, filed with the Commission and served on the uh, applicant uh, within seven days of the employer having received the application. And the importance of that form is that it identifies a range of objections that could be made to the application on the basis of um, jurisdiction, that is, um, any arguments that, the, that might be made as to why the applicant isn't eligible to bring their unfair dismissal claim. Okay, so there's, once uh, an application has been received and the employer response form uh, has been received, there are certain matters uh, that the Commission will deal with, if necessary, prior to the application progressing to the point where the parties come together to try and settle uh, the matter in some way or form. Um, as uh, Deputy President Clancy uh, mentioned, one of the requirements in making an application is that a filing fee uh, is paid or uh, an application for a waiver is made. If a filing fee is not paid ultimately, then the application is not properly made uh, to the Commission because the filing fee is part of the application and the non-payment of a filing fee will be an incomplete application, just as leaving all of the, uh, the fields blank on the form will make it an incomplete application. And we may, the Commission may deal with those matters uh, before they go anywhere else and may dismiss them if uh, the applicant doesn't respond to the queries of the Commission. There are, of course, a number of objections that an employer in their response might make to an application uh, based on their view that the applicant isn't entitled to make the application. Um, and they're referred to as the jurisdictional objections. So the respondent, the employer, uh, is saying that the Commission doesn't have the power or the jurisdiction to deal with the application. The jurisdictional objections that, uh, that we receive um, uh, go to whether the application is lodged out of time, if the applicant wasn't an employee of the employer that they've named, uh, if the applicant wasn't dismissed, the employer might say the person resigned, um, if the uh, reason for dismissal was a genuine redundancy, and that's defined in the Act, if the person hasn't uh, um, finished or completed the minimum employment period necessary, uh, if they earn above the high income threshold and are not covered by an award or agreement, or if the Small Business Fair Dismissal Code um, applies. Now, a number of the jurisdictional objections get dealt with before we get into the merits of the application. Um, we deal with these issues before the merits are dealt with because it's not necessary to deal with the merits to understand the arguments on the jurisdictional objections. And it saves the parties time um, and, and some costs if the jurisdictional objections are sorted through in the first instance. Um, so what we've got up uh, is a list of those matters that we deal with before we ask or get into the merits of the reason for dismissal, extension of time, minimum employment period, um, if the person was a casual employee not engaged on a regular and systematic basis, 
plan cover threshold, um, if the person was dismissed at the end of a specific task or um, a season, so the, a fruit picking season for example, um, if they were demoted but it wasn't a significant demotion, um, or if they've made multiple applications. Um, the Act requires a person who's been dismissed to make a decision about what sort of dismissal application they are going to make uh, because there are other applications available under the Fair Work Act besides an unfair dismissal. So a person could opt to make because they believe um, that they've been dismissed in breach of the general protections provisions, for example, but you can't make multiple applications and just hope that one of them hits the mark. Uh, you have to make a decision about which path uh, you're going to go down. Uh, the minimum employment period is a very important um, concept in uh, unfair dismissal uh, matters. Uh, an, em an employee must have served a minimum employment period before they are eligible to make an application for unfair dismissal. Um, can, uh, you do get, uh, and um, we do hear from applicants who've been employed for less than six months or 12 months who say, but my dismissal was unfair. Um, and it may well be that their dismissal was unfair, but the Commission can't deal with those applications unless the employee has served the minimum employment period. The minimum employment period is six months, um, except for employees of small businesses where the minimum employment period is 12 months. Um, the slide says SMEs for some reason, it should actually say small businesses. And small businesses are defined in the Fair Work Act as uh, employers who employ fewer than 15 employees, counting the person who was dismissed. Um, and the count of the number of employees occurs prior to dismissal, so immediately prior to dismissal. Um, there are uh, what counts as service, um, of course, isn't straightforward. Um, unfortunately, in most cases it is because a person will simply have been employed by the same employer for the last five years, their employment's <coughs> terminated, there's no argument about it. Uh, the difficulties arise and a little bit of uh, uh, extra work's required to be done if there's been a transmission of business and then whether the service is continuous or not um, with the, uh, the change of employer. Um, for casual employees, because casual employees uh, in some cases do have the right to make an application for unfair dismissal, um, their periods of casual employment um, have to be regular and systematic. Um, and uh, that is one of those matters that we, are, that we will deal with prior to the merits of the case, particularly for casual employees, if there's an argument about whether they were employed on a regular and systematic basis. So the employer has been notified of the application um, and has lodged their response. Um, uh, some jurisdictional issues may have been resolved uh, in the process. Um, the next stage of the process is to try and resolve the dispute between the parties, the, the dis unfair dismissal claim, without having to go to formal hearing. And this is done through the conciliation process uh, in the Commission. Um, the conciliation process is carried out um, primarily by staff conciliators, so not by members of the Commission, but by staff conciliators who um, have extensive training and expertise in conducting conciliations. They conciliate um, in probably 99.5% of cases over the phone um, and have uh, a very good success rate in terms of being able to resolve the matter satisfactorily to both parties at that conciliation stage. So they settle around about 80% of matters at the conciliation stage. Um, it's becoming more common now for the Commission um, uh, at later stages for, for um, applications that go through conciliation and don't settle, when they're getting closer to the date of hearing, to offer um, a further conciliation to the parties 
um, are conducted by a member and um, we found that that's, that's starting to improve the settlement rate without matters having to go to hearing um, and without having to um, uh, write formal decisions. Um, and that means that we can spend more time on the more difficult cases and concentrate on uh, those more difficult cases that can't be resolved. The next stage of the process, step five, having gone through conciliation, the matter not settled, um, is that the application comes before a member of the Commission for formal determination. And that means um, that um, the matter um, needs to be dealt with um, by hearing or by determinative conference. So uh, at that stage, the Commission has to um, form the view as to whether or not there's been an unfair dismissal. And in section 385 of the Act, uh, there are uh, a number of matters that the Commission needs to be satisfied um, about if it is to determine someone's been unfairly dismissed. Um, so we'll uh, look at a few things uh, there. In terms of what a member um, needs to turn his or her mind to in determining uh, an unfair dismissal uh, case uh, and what um, is sometimes the experience and that is that sometimes the parties don't um, address or fulsomely address all of the criteria in section 387 of the Act which um, sets out what is a harsh, unjust or unreasonable dismissal. Um, sometimes the parties don't address um, in the case of a small business employer uh, whether the dismissal was consistent with the Small Business Fair Dismissal Code. Um, and uh, uh, secondly, or thirdly, sorry, um, the parties will focus entirely on the merits of the application and not necessarily um, what might be the remedy in the event that the application is successful. So um, often the question of reinstatement and the orders um, that are associated with that aren't addressed, um, nor do the parties face into the compensation criteria uh, which we'll step through as the presentation progresses. There are some matters of jurisdiction that are dealt with um, as part of um, the determining of the merits of the claim and uh, we list those on the slide here um, such as whether there was a resignation or not, uh, whether there was a dismissal or not. Uh, we look at the Small Business Fair Dismissal Code if a redundancy is argued by the um, employer, uh, whether there was a genuine redundancy, and that's a term defined in the Act, um, whether the uh, individual was an employee or an independent contractor, whether the named respondent was in fact the employer, and uh, um, at, uh, in various cases sometimes the um, employer or the respondent to the application will say this claim is without merit and uh, complete merit and try and um, make application to uh, have the matter dismissed before it um, goes to a full hearing. Looking at some of these jurisdictional objections, well, uh, the question of whether someone has been dismissed, uh, the Act requires the um, termination to be at the initiative of the employer. Uh, now, in, in in many cases that's going to be uh, relatively uncontroversial because a person will be notified by their employer that their um, employment has been terminated. But um, there will also be cases in, in, in uh, which there are resignations and the question that the Commission has to resolve is whether that resignation was a forced one and was the employee forced to resign because of some conduct on behalf of the employer. I mentioned the criteria about whether um, a dismissal is harsh, unjust or unreasonable, um, which is set out in section 387 of the Act. And in that sense, um, you can see on the slide, um, and we'll go through them all, uh, these are the, uh, this is the criteria. Um, so um, often the case, um, uh, there's a great deal of attention drawn to whether there's a valid reason, but that's just one of the factors that goes to whether a dismissal is harsh, unjust or unreasonable. And uh, there are uh, another uh, seven or so criteria that uh, need to be considered and weighed by the member of the Commission in determining uh, whether or not the dismissal has been harsh, unjust or unreasonable. 
The first, the first of the criteria is uh, whether there's a valid reason um, for the dismissal. Um, the determination of a valid reason, whether there was or was not a, a valid reason for the dismissal of the employee, um, will depend on whether the reason for the dismissal was sound, defensible or well-founded. Um, uh, and if the reason was capricious, fanciful, spiteful or prejudiced, it won't be a valid reason. Um, one of the important things to remember is, is that a valid reason is only one of the criteria that the Commission needs to uh, determine. Uh, it can be that there is a valid reason for dismissal, but the dismissal is still found to be harsh, unjust um, or unreasonable for a range of other reasons and the other criteria um, that need to be determined. Um, it's not enough for an employer to come along and say, well, I had a good reason for doing it. Um, that's, that's not the, the test. And the requirement is that the Commission objectively determine uh, whether the reason for dismissal was valid. So it's not enough that an employer believes that the reason was valid. It's up to the Commission to determine for itself, based on the evidence that's put to the Commission, whether the reason <coughs> was valid. Um, and this is where it's important that the parties, whether it's the applicant or the employer, come along and present and tell the totality of the story uh, of what occurred in their case so that the Commission can make an informed decision about whether the valid reason uh, exists. The second criteria um, is that an employee or a person has to be notified of the valid reason for their dismissal prior to the dismissal. Um, uh, there's no point um, telling someone the reason for the dismissal after you've decided or, or after you've dismissed them because then the person has no capacity uh, to put anything back to the employer that might sway the employer's mind. Um, the employee might say, well, no, actually it wasn't me. I wasn't at work that day. It can't have been me who did it. Um, it wasn't me involved in the fight um, because I was in the sick bay um, having my cut finger seen to. Um, if the employee is never given an opportunity to defend themselves, to give some defence, um, then it may well be that they're denied procedural fairness, or they will be denied procedural fairness. And the consideration of procedural fairness um, is also an important aspect um, of whether um, uh, a dismissal is harsh, unjust or unreasonable. And it, as I said before, it can be that there is a valid reason, but if the person was never given the chance to respond, it might be um, that the denial of procedural fairness has made the dismissal unfair. Um, the fourth... Um, the fourth uh, criteria is um, around support people. Um, now, there's no obli positive obligation on an employer to offer the employee an opportunity to have a support person, but if someone requests one, then an employer must not unreasonably refuse that support person being present. And that goes to the, uh, the notion of procedural fairness and uh, making sure that uh, a person's had an opportunity to uh, respond to allegations um, or reasons given by their employer as to why their employment might be at risk of termination. Uh, in terms of um, warnings, um, now it's often uh, still the uh, uh, an accepted wisdom in the community that people are entitled to three warnings or a final warning. Uh, it's not necessarily the case. Um, but what this criteria goes um, to is if there has been unsatisfactory uh, performance, and that's the reason relied on, um, then the Commission asks the question as whether that person has been um, warned about the unsatisfactory performance before the dismissal uh, has uh, been brought into effect. Um, unsatisfactory performance is more likely uh, to relate to a person's capacity to perform the job that they were hired to do rather than their, their conduct um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the role. So uh, the issues of conduct might be a one-off, the performance might be uh, 
a repeated failure to meet the expectations of an employer. Um, and the question that the Commission will be asking itself is, well, if uh, there was this um, view formed that the person didn't meet the expectations and didn't perform in the role, was that communicated to the um, employee? Was the employee given an opportunity to respond? Was the employee provided with some coaching or training or some direction uh, and then given some time to see whether or not the uh, performance did um, lift and meet the standard of the employer? The size of the enterprise and the absence of uh, human resources specialist or expertise, this is a factor the Commission can have regard to um, and it really goes to the question of whether the size is a factor um, that might have impacted the procedures used in the dismissal um, and whether or not there was an absence of human resources uh, or human resources department or human resources personnel um, and again whether that absence may have impacted um, the way in which the, uh, the dismissal uh, was carried out. So um, it, it, it's brought into focus with small business employers. Um, if you're a, a large multinational with thousands of employees, it's not going to necessarily, it's not going to be a factor in your case, uh, but it's, it's really a question of um, whether uh, any defects in pr process can be explained away by the size of the employer, uh, the size of the employer and the fact that they don't have um, in-house HR expectation, uh, sorry, expertise. And finally, there's a catch-all provision, section 387, subsection H, um, which gives the Commission some broad scope to uh, look at matters that it might consider relevant. And I've given some examples there on the slide, the employee's age, the length of their service, uh, their future employment prospects, um, their past disciplinary record, um, the proportionality of the dismissal to the conduct um, that was the subject of the valid reason. Is, is the decision to terminate disproportionate? Um, and then consistency of approach. So uh, some cases require the Commission to give consideration well, um, if that employee was dismissed but three others who were engaged in similar conduct weren't, um, is that fair? Or unfair. Um, and they're some of the things that uh, the Commission can have regard to. So having uh, considered uh, each of the criteria and determined, and uh, if it is determined that the dismissal uh, was harsh, unjust um, or unreasonable um, and therefore unfair, the next question that the Commission has to turn its mind to and that the parties need to address the Commission on is the question of remedy. So what is, what is it that the applicant wants uh, to remediate the unfair dismissal um, that they uh, believe they've suffered? The primary remedy um, for uh, unfair dismissal is reinstatement. Uh, the Act uh, is clear and the decisions of the Commission are clear uh, that, the third, that the primary remedy available to an employee is reinstatement. Uh, the, the greatest proportion of employees um, making a claim for unfair dismissal seek a, seek a remedy of compensation, um, but uh, reinstatement uh, is not um, unusual um, and is a legitimate claim for an employee to make. Um, the test to be applied as to whether reinstatement um, should occur is, whether, is a test of appropriateness. So is it appropriate um, that a person be reinstated into the workplace? Um, we say that appropriateness is the, is, is the test because the Commission can only order compensation in the form of, of payment, uh, generally a payment of money if reinstatement is not appropriate. So the first, if you're going to look at reinstatement, the first thing to look at is whether it's appropriate. Um, the Fair Work Act doesn't identify any particular criteria that the Commission needs to take into account in determining whether um, uh, reinstatement is appropriate or not. So the Commission actually has quite a broad 
um, uh, remit in terms of what it might take into account in determining um, the appropriateness of reinstatement. One of the relevant considerations and the most common consideration is whether um, trust and confidence in the employment relationship can be restored. Um, and this is particularly so where dismissal is because of misconduct, for, for reasons in, involving misconduct. Um, but trust and confidence is not the only criteria on which the Commission will decide whether reinstatement is appropriate, and it's not even a necessary criteria. It's not a criteria that's mentioned in the Act, so the, um, uh, um, the consideration of it is just one of the matters that the Commission might consider. Um, I recently had an employer suggest that um, they had lost trust and confidence in a person who'd been, um, I'd found was unfairly dismissed, um, because if they hadn't lost trust and confidence, they would have reinstated the person already. Um, I thought that that was a bit of a, a difficult argument to get through because it just meant that anyone who the employer hadn't voluntarily taken back could never get their job back. Um, so uh, it, it, the, the most difficult thing in dealing with reinstatement is that an employer will come, employers will often come along and say, well, I've lost trust and confidence uh, in the employee, they can't come back but will never give any reasons as to why they've lost trust and confidence. The statement of a loss of trust and confidence is not evidence of the loss of trust and confidence. And, train, and, and claims of the loss um, have to be rationally based. Um, the fact that the person had been dismissed is not grounds of itself um, to say that trust and confidence um, is lost. So if the Commission's formed the view that reinstatement is not the appropriate remedy, um, it can give consideration to uh, the question of compensation, but an award of compensation does not automatically follow. The compensation will only be ordered um, if, it, uh, if it, compensation, is considered appropriate by the Commission. Uh, and that means that you might have a case where, uh, even though um, the decision of the Commission is that the person has been unfairly dismissed, they may not get a payment of compensation. Um, sometimes it's quite illuminating for um, uh, parties, particularly unrepresented parties, um, to learn that they can't uh, receive a payment of compensation for the shock or the distress or the hurt or humiliation associated with the manner of their dismissal. Um, and um, uh, it might be um, only when they um, come before a member that member says, um, uh, I can only compensate you for uh, the loss of remuneration, not because of uh, the, uh, the feelings that this dismissal um, has uh, invoked in you. And um, then the, the conversation uh, and the case focuses on the considerations the Commission must take into account in calculating compensation. Uh, and then you'll see on the screen um, there are seven criteria for the Commission to um, uh, address in terms of compensation. Uh, there's the impact on the employer's enterprise, and that's only going to come into play if um, the um, employing entity is in financial distress and there's a capacity to pay uh, question. It's not because they don't want to pay, it is a capacity to pay. Uh, the length of a person's service with an employer um, is considered. Um, longer periods of service weigh towards uh, a higher payment of compensation uh, than it would be the case for someone who's been with their employer for six months and one day. Uh, the remuneration that would have been received, and that involves an evaluation of, um, but for the dismissal, how long might this employment relationship um, have persisted? How, much, how long might it have continued? Um, the Commission will consider the efforts made by a, um, uh, a former employee to mitigate their loss. Uh, that is, um, consideration will be given to whether that employer, uh, former employee has sought new employment, has made um, attempts to uh, seek new employment, um, whether they've applied for jobs, and indeed whether they have obtained um, new employment. And uh, uh, the Commission um, 
uh, or the Act doesn't contemplate a person um, sitting at home and waiting for their unfair dismissal um, application to be heard before um, uh, they move on to the next phase of their, their working life. Um, the Commission will also assess the amount of remuneration that a person's earned since their dismissal. Um, so uh, if someone has um, had the good fortune of securing alternative employment, what they've earned in that employment will be taken into account in assessing um, the amount of compensation and then indeed the income likely to be earned um, uh, between the time of the um, Commission hearing the case and making any decision. And then uh, again, a catch-all provision of any other relevant matter. In terms of uh, some other factors going to compensation, um, if misconduct was the reason for um, the dismissal and uh, that was found to be um, proven, um, that can reduce the amount of compensation. So um, as uh, uh, the Commission alluded to before, um, it may be the case that uh, there was a valid reason found for the termination, but there were some other issues related um, to the termination that made it unfair, um, such as um, a failure to afford procedural fairness um, and deficiencies in process. However, if someone's misconduct uh, lay behind the reason for their termination, the Commission can reduce the amount um, of compensation it would otherwise order. Um, um, as I mentioned, it, there is the exclusion for shock, distress, humiliation and hurt. Um, and then um, the Commission does retain a discretion to um, um, increase or decrease the amount that uh, it might award having regard to uh, the criteria um, because in, ultimately its power is to um, award compensation that it considers appropriate which gives um, that scope. And then finally um, the Commission has to have regard to the compensation cap. Uh, so the compensation cap is that the maximum that can be awarded here at the Commission for an unfair dismissal application is currently in dollar terms $72,700 and uh, that um, is subject to uh, a formula that's set out in the Act. Um, uh, in, in generic terms you look at uh, what uh, someone might have earned in uh, the 26 weeks uh, uh, before the dismissal um, or half the high income threshold immediately before the dismissal, uh, whichever is the lower. Um, and uh, uh, that is to say, uh, it, can't be, it can't be in excess of um, $72,700. So, um, uh, for example, if a person is covered by an enterprise agreement or an award and their earnings are higher than $145,400, their uh, maximum compensation will still be capped at $72,700. Okay, so having um, gone through um, the process, what is it um, that might slow the process down in terms of the Commission being able to deal uh, with an application in a timely manner? And we'll talk about the, uh, the timelines that we try and work to. Uh, in the Commission a little bit later. Um, what I want to talk about now is just some of the common issues and defects that we see in the applications that come before the Commission that slow the process down and make it more difficult for us um, and for the administrative um, staff here at the Commission as well. Um, one of the common defects um, is that um, an application form or an employer response form are not completed properly. Um, and they're not signed. Now, clearly, uh, the Commission needs to be confident that an application that's made um, is properly made and is made by the person who it is said is making the application and a signature on the form is a very important um, part of that process. Given the capacity now to make applications electronically, uh, there is a means by which um, uh, a signature can be deemed to be uh, placed on the form so that you don't actually have to print it out, sign it, scan it and then send the form into the Commission. Um, incomplete answers on an application form um, also cause delays in the system because it means that the 
uh, commission staff need to go back to an applicant um, and get them to redo their application in some form. Um, there's simple things that are important bits of information for the commission, um, including things like the date of commencement with the employer, because that helps us determine whether the minimum employment period uh, has been served, um, when the person was notified of their dismissal, um, when the dismissal took effect, if um, a person might have been given two weeks notice of their dismissal, they might have been dismissed um, uh, with immediate effect, and the identity of the employer. Now, um, I think that um, uh, I certainly appreciate that for some employees it can actually be quite difficult to properly identify the employer because they've got something on their contract of employment um, that says who the employer is, there's a different name, um, might appear on their pay slip, um, they're not quite sure who uh, really employs them. But the more information that we're given, that the Commission is given on the application form, the better chance we have um, of being able to progress the form through the processes that it needs to go through. Um, the, one of the other common uh, defects is a failure to, to pay the filing fee um, or to make an application for a waiver. And as I mentioned earlier, um, without a filing fee being paid, the application is not considered to be complete and can't be dealt with by the Commission. Um, uh, the only way we can deal with an application without the payment of a filing fee is if a waiver is sought and there's a waiver form um, that's easily found on the Commission's website along with um, the application form. Um, if there's an applicant, if the applicant is represented, um, uh, then they need to provide the relevant details to say that they can um, and will pay the filing fee associated with the application. And sometimes the representatives uh, forget to do what they're required to do on the forms as well. Um, there are uh, times when a party, either an applicant or an employer, is represented um, by uh, um, a lawyer or a, a firm that specialises in dealing with unfair dismissals and that firm doesn't provide enough information to the Commission for us to be able to contact, for the Commission to be able to contact um, the firm appropriately. Um, a, a generic email address for a firm, um, no name for the actual person within the firm who's dealing with the application will slow the process down. Um, uh, and uh, the, a delay in the process just then starts to build um, and it means that uh, the matter won't be dealt with um, as effectively or efficiently um, as it should be. Um, uh, another common uh, difficulty with uh, application forms or response forms in particular um, is the employer not putting in the response form in a timely manner. Um, the Commission um, wants to ensure a fair go all round to everyone in the process of dealing with an unfair dismissal application, um, which means that we will try and get the information out of the employer. We will try and um, follow up the employer and give them an opportunity to put material in. Um, but ultimately, a continued failure by the employer to do so uh, may result, as the Deputy President um, mentioned earlier, in the matter being determined without the employer um, being engaged in the process at all and uh, ignoring it, as was said, does not make it go away. Uh, the Commission um, wants to deal with uh, applications before it um, in an efficient manner, um, which is balanced with uh, the capacity for parties to present the case that they want to present. Uh, but we um, feel it's important that uh, we move through the process um, in as timely a manner as possible. And what I've stepped out here is the benchmarks that uh, we have set for ourselves. So if you look at the termination date as being um, day one, um, and an application being filed within um, 
three weeks. Um, that takes us up to a three week timeline. Um, we then have a benchmark of listing a telephone conciliation within a further five weeks, which takes us up to eight weeks. If the telephone conciliation is unsuccessful, um, our objective is then to have a hearing listed within a further 10 weeks of that unsuccessful telephone conciliation. And within that 10 week time period, um, the parties are then directed to file and serve the material upon which they intend to rely at the hearing of their matter. Once the hearing is conducted, um, uh, members of the Commission uh, are required to um, issue a decision within eight weeks. Um, and that's our benchmark and we try to aim to it. Um, uh, we're asked to achieve that in 90% of cases and if not um, by uh, 12 weeks after the hearing. So all going to plan, the Commission can um, process, uh, deal with and determine an unfair dismissal application within a six month period. Why is that important? Well, it goes back to uh, some of the remedies that can be awarded. The practicality of reinstatement. Um, if you want to reinstate someone to employment, obviously the sooner that happens, the better. Um, people uh, on both sides of the equation, employees and uh, their former employers, um, having finality, um, being able to uh, have certainty in relation to that employment relationship and being able to move on. So uh, they're the timelines and our case management processes that we adopt are uh, aimed to achieve those timelines. Um, an applicant's entitled to have his or her case heard um, and it, equally it's in the interest of everyone that that um, application is resolved in as timely a manner as possible. Um, so the directions we set um, must be complied with and a repeated failure to do so can result in an application being dismissed without it going to a hearing. Um, and. Uh, parties need to be conscious of that. Directions can be varied and extended, but it's the exception rather than the rule. Um, we want to keep the matter moving. Uh, a little hard to read this slide, but we do um, address um, questions as to adjournments and uh, extensions uh, by looking at things such as the unavailabilities of the parties, which is obviously a primary consideration. The parties sh should have the opportunity to be um, able to present their case. Um, but if someone says I'm going on a holiday, we'll ask for um, their itinerary um, and we'll want to know when it's booked um, uh, to make sure that uh, we can keep the matter moving. Representatives availability or unavailability, well, um, a party doesn't have the automatic right to be represented by a lawyer or a paid agent, so we'll have that in the back of our mind. Uh, we're not going to have a, um, a matter delayed because um, a representative might not be available, but we will look at things like um, the capacity of the person to represent themselves and if that person has already spent um, a lot of time and money on their representative, um, we'll ensure that that representative can be present. Witness availability, it comes down to in the end um, how relevant that witness is to the issues to be determined. So if you've got four people who were present at a termination meeting, and one of them is going to be away, that's unlikely to result in an adjournment, but if there was only one person present, and that's the only witness that the respondent, for example, wants to call, um, we'll have regard to that. Uh, but again, if they're going away on a holiday or on a cruise, um, we'll want to know when that booking was made and uh, does it in fact cover the period. Uh, there are rights of the parties to uh, have documents um, produced to the Commission or request documents to be um, produced to the Commission. Again, um, the guiding principle here is um, set out in section 590 of the Act and so the Commission can inform itself. It's not for the parties to build their own case by requiring the production of documents. And we'll look at um, whether the documents being requested are relevant to the questions that the Commission is required to determine. So parties seeking documents will have to persuade the Commission that they're relevant to those issues. Um, obviously, the earlier you make an application for production of documents, um, the more receptive the Commission is going to be. If you turn up the night before the case and say, look, I want uh, 18 ring uh, binders full of folders, uh, full of documents, um, you're, you're unlikely to get a sympathetic hearing as uh, if you uh, are onto it straight away and are explaining to the Commission why it's going to be relevant. 
permission to be represented. It's not an automatic right. Um, the parties um, need to um, address section 596 and for any practitioners it's a dead giveaway if you've never read section 596 and you're seeking leave to appear. It's permission to be represented um, and the criteria needs to be uh, addressed. It is a matter of discretion and the approach of members differs. Um, but uh, um, the Commission will weigh it up and uh, make sure that uh, what guides us is the capacity of parties to be able to present the case that they want to present um, to the Commission. Um, at the very beginning I, I mentioned that about 40% of the matters that come before the Commission um, are unfair dismissal applications. Um, in, in the last financial year, we received 13,595 unfair dismissal applications. Um, so that gives you a sense of the, um, the workload um, that unfair dismissal applications are for the Commission, and it's a significant part um, of our workload. But as the, um, as the unfair dismissal application goes through the process, the number of cases uh, reduces as matters settle or applicants withdraw um, uh, the application. So about uh, 2,380 odd applications uh, last financial year were withdrawn prior to conciliation. Um, it might be because the applicant, um, having put in the application, um, receives a call from the case management staff at the Commission who say, well, you actually haven't been employed for long enough. You, it looks like you were only employed for three months. Are you aware that you need to have been employed for six months? And the person may say, well, I wasn't aware of that. I am now. I'll withdraw the application. I won't pursue it. Um, so there are a whole range of reasons why, why a person may uh, withdraw their application uh, prior to conciliation, and uh, it's, it's up to them. Having put in the application, it's the applicant's um, application, and they can determine whether they wish it uh, to proceed or not. Um, 10,500 or so applications were settled at conciliation uh, last financial year. Um, uh, um, and another 779 um, were finalised uh, by the Commission uh, by decision. Uh, that decision may have been a jurisdictional decision, um, so it may well be a decision that um, an extension of time shouldn't be granted, the person wasn't dismissed, um, the matter was a genuine redundancy and therefore um, not a dismissal. Um, and 263 applications, having gone through all of that process, um, actually lead to a merits decision um, by the Commission. That is a decision on the merits of the claim for unfair dismissal, whether the, the dismissal was unfair. Um, uh, at that point, um, about 40% of applications um, are dismissed because the dismissal was not unfair, i.e. The, the, the dismissal uh, was a fair dismissal, or at least it wasn't an unfair dismissal. Um, of the balance, um, the Commission last financial year made 110 orders for compensation. 68% um, of those were for less than $10,000. Um, and 15% for between 10 and 20,000 and the remainder above that. Um, only six orders were made for reinstatement and that sits with what I said earlier about um, most applicants seeking a monetary compensation and not reinstatement. Um, uh, 17 orders for reinstatement and for payment of lost remuneration. Um, so a, a person seeking reinstatement can seek lost remuneration for the period between the loss of their job and the reinstatement. Seven applications were granted but no remedy was awarded as the Deputy President mentioned um, earlier. Um, and 19 applications were granted but remedy um, was to be dealt with in a later uh, matter. So this Further information, there's a lot of information as you can see from the presentation, there are many factors that go into the determination of an unfair dismissal application. Um, there are designated pages on the Commission's website dedicated to the unfair dismissal jurisdiction um, and there is on the website links to the 
Commission's unfair dismissal uh, bench book, which contains um, in plain language uh, all the sorts of things that we've been discussing tonight and relevant cases. Um, and again, um, if you explore the website, uh, there are virtual tours you can take. There's an eligibility quiz that uh, applicants um, can undertake to see whether they're um, eligible to bring a claim. The bench books, and finally, the workplace advisory service, which is free legal assistance provided by um, lawyers that participate in a pro bono capacity um, to small business employers and self-represented individuals. Um, Small business employers uh, can't be a member of an employer organisation or have in-house HR or legal expertise. If you're a multinational, you're not going to get uh, advice uh, from the Workplace Advice Service. And self-represented individuals, so if someone's a member of a union or have a lawyer, again, they're not eligible to use the service. Um, it's an advisory service um, and uh, it gives some advice about the sort of things that need to be addressed and uh, the Commission facilitates um, those appointments. Um, and they're completely independent, the lawyers that participate from the Commission. It's an arm's length uh, arrangement. Um, and, uh, but uh, ultimately it's, it's some preliminary advice and parties, unless those law firms agree to take on their case, uh, will then be required to subsequently prepare and present their case. Uh, thank you very much. I think we've gone slightly over time, but uh, we wanted to cover all that material. Um, Thank you very much for your attendance and um, thank you, Michelle, for your uh, assistance as well. We hope you found uh, the information useful. The presentation will be available, uh, I believe, and um, I think there's also some material on the Workplace Advisory Service um, available here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.